Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's PB webinar. My name is Amanda Pauly, and I'm Deputy Editor at PB. And today we're going to be talking about how to prevent contact allergies. Um, so today I'm George by, joined by Georgie Smedley and Jazz um, from the Georgie Smedley Group. I'm sure loads of you know who they are. And they're going to be talking about what now techs need to do to prevent contact allergies from occurring, covering the science behind what happens, the risks, the signs to look out for, and also kind of sharing top tips on working safely to stop this from happening. Now, anytime during this webinar, if you have any questions, if you just pop it in the chat box on Zoom or on Facebook, I will make sure to ask Georgie and Jazz any questions that you have at the end. But Georgie and Jazz, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you both? Really well, thank you. We're both joining from home, back to work tomorrow, properly, because all <laughs> working in the background obviously but yeah back to work looking forward to the new normal yeah I think everyone's looking forward to getting back to work tomorrow aren't they in England which is great um so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my camera and mic off let you do your presentation and then I will come back at the end for any kind of audience Q&A but if you do have any technical questions I'm still here so you can just call my name out I'll jump on and um I'll get it sorted out for you thank you very much thanks so much guys see you in a bit so I'm going to share my screen for you guys. I've done a little bit of a presentation just so that you can actually see something in front of your eyes, not just my face and my voice talking to you all the time because that can get a little bit boring. So yeah, this is such a, an on the ball subject at the moment, isn't it? Contact allergies because it's happening everywhere um, and more and more and more. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to prevent them, why they happen. So I'm going to move my face off of this screen if I can. <laughs> there we go. So the question is, what are contact allergies? And it is exactly what it says. It's an allergy as a result of making contact, isn't it? So it's making contact to a substance or a chemical that you might be using. And it can happen to you as a technician it can happen to your clients so we're going to explain how and why it happens a little bit further down so how does it occur and it's very very simple and you probably actually all already know the answer um, and probably deep down you know how you know why you know how to treat it but it's good to reinforce it and get some extra hints and tips. So it's repeated contact with a chemical that isn't designed to go on the skin, okay? And then we've got the health and safety guidelines that the government give us. We should be following them and we're gonna go through what they are as well. What are the risks associated with contact allergies? So obviously with an allergy, it's not something nice to suffer. Um, there's many, many ways that you can recognize an allergy. I'm gonna go through that um, in one of the slides. But unfortunately, if you are presented with an allergy, it means that your body has become overexposed and it's something that can't be undone. If you continue to use a product that you're allergic to or a customer is allergic to, it means that not only are you gonna have a contact allergy to that item or that substance, you will become more and more and more sensitive and you literally become sensitive to even shampoo you know it will go that far so you absolutely mustn't try to persevere using that thing that you're allergic to because it just gets worse because once you're allergic to it you're always allergic to it you cannot desensitize from it um and that's something that we have had to learn through experience with people that have done it and all the rules you know so it can't be reversed, but on a more positive side, the effects of the reactions will usually be temporary and completely disappear. And remember, guys, if you do have any questions, um, please pop them onto the chat and um, we can answer them at the end. So there are three routes of entry into the body. OK, you've got a nice little image there that just helps you to remember how a chemical can get into your body. And we're gonna go into them in a little bit more depth. 
So inhalation, what can you inhale? You can inhale the dust that occurs when you're actually filing the nail. You can in inhale the vapors and that's something that will evaporate. So if you're using a liquid and powder system that evaporates, that gets into the air and you can inhale it. Ingestion, that means it gets into your mouth. Now, obviously you're not gonna start eating the products. We all know we're not gonna do that. However, it can still get into your mouth. How does that get into your mouth? Again, we're gonna go through that in a minute, but what can get into your mouth? Again, the chemicals and the dust. Um, and then skin absorption. This is the most likely way that you're going to actually have a chemical enter into your body. And that's the chemicals that you're using. Again, liquid and powder being the most um, likely one, but we, we do see a lot with gel polish as well. And it's just about not getting those products onto the skin so here we go the root, roots of entry explained how do i avoid them so that first one there is really about when you breathe it in you can just imagine how are you going to breathe those items in those substances in how does dust get in the air if you're filing nails it's automatically going to go into the air isn't it and then the heavy particles settle down onto your desk and the lighter particles that you can't really see that's what gets into your nose so a good ventilation system and that ventilation should not be above your nose because if you've got it right up here it's pulling that dust right past your face and you're going to breathe it in aren't you so it should be below your nose so that it pulls it away from you um, it's a good idea to contact your health and safety officer because they can give you um, the allowed amount of um, vapor in square footage. So they, they calculate how big your area is and how many windows you should have open or if you should have a ventilation system. So they can help with that because a lot of people say, well, I've only got a small room, do I need a ventilation system? But on the other hand, if you've got a really big space, you're, you've got a less concentrated vapor in the air. So contact health and safety for that and inspector can tell you because I believe it's different in the various different councils. Controlled product application. So we're talking about the actual things that can get into the air, which are vapors. Now, vapors are liquids that are volatile. What does that mean? If something is volatile, it means it evaporates very, very quickly. So if you're using, for example, isopropyl alcohol or acetone, and if you get that on, um, if you put that on the nail, you see it disappears very, very quickly. That is a volatile liquid. The more volatile it is, the more it's getting into the air. So, and things like um, liquid and powder systems, acrylic liquid and powder, all of those solvents are volatile and they get into the air. So how do you reduce that? You've got to keep the lids on. You've got to make sure that you're throwing away your desk towels, that you're wiping your brush on. It's all of those little things that you, you can just use your common sense and look at what you've got in front of you and see how it would actually get into the air. And then good housekeeping, keeping um, disposal waste, all of that stuff reduced, um, reduce the liquid or gases evaporating. And then um, the dust as well, making sure that you're keeping your desk wiped. It's not between clients, it's at every stage. You know, if you're filing, you're filing at one stage and then you're doing something else and then you're going back to filing again. So at every stage of filing, for example, you would clean your desk, your workspace to make sure that there isn't any dust on, on your workspace. Then ingestion, and as we said earlier, you're not going to be physically putting any chemicals into your mouth on purpose, you know, obviously. Um, but how is it going to get into your mouth? If you actually have um, not washed your hands, for example, and you've been using liquid and powder and you've got it on your hands and then you go and eat a sandwich, it's going to transfer from your hands onto a sandwich into your mouth. It's quite simple and straightforward. You wouldn't eat at your desk, you wouldn't drink at your desk, um, and you wouldn't keep any food items or drinks in the same room because they literally suck in the vapours from the products that you're using and dust settles on them. So, you know, it's common sense, isn't it? You really shouldn't be doing that at your desk. Um, 
and then always use clean towels and tissues. So if, for example, you've picked up a desk towel that's on your desk and taken it with you to go and eat your sandwich, that desk towel will have absorbed the vapors and it will have had set, uh, dust settle on it. So you're not going to go wipe your mouth with that desk towel, even though it's intended for different uses. Yeah, but don't use one that's come out of your nail salon. And then absorption. This is where you would absorb it into your skin. And it's really mostly the way that people are absorbing the product into their body because how many nail videos have you seen where you're ha you're seeing gel polish being painted beautifully on the nail and then there's a little bit that goes on, on the skin so not only has that bit of the nail polish or the gel polish gone onto the skin but then the nail tech uses her thumbnail to wipe off yeah, and we see and, and you know we're tempted to do it all the time i i i I've sort of been conscious of it and known that I've done it in the past. And I, you know, really make sure that you're focused and always aware because we get into a rut, don't we? And we get into habits and we just need to review our habits every so often to make sure that we're keeping right on top of things. So what are the signs of a contact allergy? They can be any part of your body, believe it or not. Um, it's usually around the nail or under the free edge of the nail and it usually starts off with itching and that's a definite telltale sign and sometimes your client won't even tell you because they brush it off and think oh I've had my nails on it's itching a little bit but that should go and the first once or twice it might go um, or it might lead on to something far more severe you know the day after but you should always educate your clients with regards to contact allergies or overexposure. Okay, so make sure that you're telling them right from the very beginning, whilst you're filling out their client record card, you need to find out if they're particularly sensitive anyway, if they've been historically sensitive to any other chemicals in the beauty industry or whatever. So make sure that you're communicating the fact that it can happen. You know, you, you can become allergic to a food type or you can become intolerant to a food type. And that's not, you know, that's not the fault of the supermarket that sold it to you. It's not the fault of a restaurant that's fed it to you. Just like it's not your fault as a nail technician, if your client becomes allergic to something, if you have been very, very careful. Now, it is your fault if you're not taking into consideration everything that we're talking about today. But it can happen. You know, it can happen the first time you use something on a client. So make sure that you are educating your clients and saying to them, just like you can become allergic to a shampoo or a food type, you can have an allergy immediately or over time to a nail product. And I will do my duty in keeping you safe by doing X, Y, and Z. But please do inform me if you have any signs of an allergy that you don't normally have after I've done your nails and it can present itself as we've already said itchy skin this can lead to blisters under the nails then the skin can start splitting and peeling eventually it can cause nail separation um, so just make sure that you're aware of everything and that they are aware that it can happen headaches that's another thing um, I think one of the systems that was most um, the biggest cause for headaches um, that I've heard is the dipping system, believe it or not. Um, although it's not a system that gives off any kind of vapor, when you are curing the system by using an activator with the resin, that combination, uh, and while it's polymerizing, it gives off this really weird thing that can make your eyes sting. For those of you that have used cyanoacrylates, you might be familiar with that. People can often get headaches with that. And then that, you know, their nose will start to block up and their eyes will start to stream. So, like I said, not necessarily on the skin, but definitely something you can have with regards to headaches. And then difficulty breathing is another one, getting a tight chest, that kind of thing. So, yeah, as I said, it's definitely a case of educating your clients so that they're aware in case they need to let you know. So how do you treat a contact allergy? So first of all, if it's appropriate, you would remove that product immediately. 
I would say definitely get your client back in. Don't let them do it themselves because you don't know what more damage that they can do. But you must make sure that you only do this if they don't have any open wounds, if they don't have blisters that are weeping. You've got to make sure that it's possible for you to pop their fingers in a nail wrap with um, some soak off solution or acetone. Because, you know, if they've got an open wound, you can definitely aggravate that if you do it too soon. So make sure that it's at least healed a little bit before you remove the product. Um, and there is a fine balance because the longer you keep that product on, sometimes that allergy can continue because there are various products that continue to cure over time. So yeah, you must make sure that it's appropriate to be able to soak those nails off before you do so. Secondly, they should see a GP for treatment. It's always recommended because we're not experts in um, the medical industry. So I would definitely recommend that they go to a doctor and the doctor will most likely get them some antihistamines and then maybe a topical cream that will just help to ease that um, symptom that they have. And then you've got to make sure that you avoid that system. You cannot put that client back on that system. However, what you should do is if you're going to change to a different system is make sure that you test um, just by popping it onto one finger before you go ahead and do a full set of a, a you know of an alternative system i mean the doctors can quite often send you for um, um testing skin testing where they use various different chemicals to pinpoint exactly what it is that you're allergic to and that's really useful if they agree to do that because then you can see which other systems that you can move on to because some, you know, for example, gel polish and acrylics, they both have acrylates in them. So if it's an acrylate that you're allergic to, you're not going to be able to use either of those two systems. If it's you that's affected as the technician, um, if you catch it early enough, you may be able to continue, but don't push your luck. OK, what I would say is you can use a barrier cream, something like Vaseline with cotton gloves and then nitrile gloves on the top. You've got to make sure that nothing can penetrate through to your skin in order for you to continue to avoid it but of course you've got to make sure that you're also not touching your face or anywhere else on your body what can text do to prevent contact allergies from occurring i've mentioned a few of them already but as a technician if you're using a liquid and powder system make sure that you haven't got liquid running down the, the brush you know like the handle of your brush if you've got liquid going down there you're going to get it on your fingers and if that's repeated you're increasing the chances of you actually getting a contact allergy yourself um make sure that you're not cleaning gel polish or whatever it is from around the skin with your fingers or your nails make sure that you're using a tool to do that make sure that you're keeping lids on your dappen dishes to make sure that the product isn't evaporating. Decan only the amount that you want to use or that you need to use. The less you have, the less it's going to evaporate. Um, and then of course, what we hear all the time with regards to gel polish is people using different brands of lamps to the brand of gel polish that they're using. So make sure that you're using the correct recommended curing equipment. Um, I've already mentioned touching your face during treatment. Uh, when you're throwing away your used desk towels, which you should be doing frequently throughout the treatment, make sure that you're putting it into a metal bin that has an inner liner and a lid. Obviously it needs to be metal because it needs to be fireproof. Um, hopefully no one's gonna be stupid enough to throw something that can cause a fire into a bin, but also it's gonna to help to reduce any vapors from escaping. And also you can remove a bag nice and easily, tie it up and put it into a black bag and dispose of it safely as well. It's recommended that you wear gloves, even if an allergy isn't present, um, but there are many, many reports showing how gloves need to be frequently changed as well. Um, I can't remember what the length of time was. I think it was something like 20 minutes that they keep a liquid from but I will try and find out that information because that's just popped into my head um, and then let you guys know when there's questions and answers afterwards um, on the thread. Dispose of used towels right away so towels will collect dust and liquid so make sure that you dispose of them as soon as you finish using them. 
We've mentioned ventilation already, um, and we've already mentioned cleaning product away from the skin using a tool and not your own fingernails. Things you should know. Now, this is really, really important, and um, it's come to light very recently because there's been so many allergies going around. Um, and I think that's mainly due to lockdown has had so many people buying kits off of the internet, you know, consumers that are not professionals. I think that's one of the main reasons why the nail industry is getting itself a really bad name because the consumer has actually been buying these kits blaming the product for creating allergies and it's purely because they you know they don't actually know what the dangers are how to avoid getting a contact allergy so find out who the manufacturer is of the product that you're using okay it should be readily available to you um, you need to know what's in that product and where it's made okay there's certain countries like china for example they have to test on animals it's the law do you want to buy a product where they test on animals I wouldn't, it's not legal here. So I, I personally, from an ethical point of view, I don't like that. So um, also they um, are known to make products with ingredients that are not EU compliant. They're not in the EU. So you need to make sure that the ingredients are EU compliant. The next slide I'm gonna show you um, has got um, a list of ingredients that are known allergens. So we're gonna go through that as well. Ingredients should be on your safety data sheet, okay? So an acrylate or methacrylate chemical has the potential to sensitize skin from overexposure. Now, if you're abiding by all of the laws and the routes of entry are in your mind all the time, you should really minimize that risk, okay? So substances such as HEMA, DIHEMA, IBA, HPMI, I've listed the ingredients on the next slide they're regarded as particularly sensitizing. Nail products containing HEMA and DIHEMA will be restricted for professional use in the EU from 2021, so I've heard. Um, they, and that's because they, they're in the home products and everyone's getting allergies. So I think that's probably the main reason why they want to restrict their use. And I don't know how far they're gonna go just yet, but that's the news that I hear. Um, you know, and like cured products, and this misuse of LED lights at home especially has caused this massive increase in contact allergies amongst the general public. So HEMA has been in the nail news um, over the last few months because it is an allergen, an allergen, it's a known allergen, but that doesn't mean you should say I'm not going to use products with HEMA in them. It means that you should be careful. It means that you need to be extra vigilant when you're using these products so that they don't get into the skin. Now, the EU has a concentration limit for HEMA of 35%. So you should be able to find out the percentage when you're looking at a safety data sheet. It should be on there. So you're going to look for a product that hasn't got too much HEMA in it. If it has got anything above that, don't use it. Um, but you know, as I've said, make sure that you're super vigilant when you're using these products. It's in almost every brand out there. It's been out there for years and years and years. It's only become so prevalent now because people aren't concentrating on what they're doing. They're not doing things correctly. And we need to make sure that we don't become complacent in our work. Keep clean, keep housekeeping rules, all of that kind of stuff that we've already mentioned. Um, Dihema, strangely enough, a maximum limit of 99%, but I don't know who's got that much in their product. Um, no other nail product ingredients have been banned except for MMA in the EU. Um, and no other products that I mentioned in the next slide have got an, a maximum percentage concentration limit. It's only really Hema and Dihema. So I've just listed some products that appear in um, the various nail systems. So for liquid and powder, MMA, we've already mentioned, is already banned. Um, these are the various chemicals that you'll find in liquid and powder, ethyl methacrylate, which is in all liquid and powder, isobutyl methacrylate, tetrahydrofuryl methacrylate, benzoyl peroxide. Uh, and then in UV builder gels and soak off um, gel polishes, um, you've got 2-hydroxyethyl methacrylate, 
which is a hema, a dihema, which is trimethyl hexyl dicarbamate, um, and also isoboronyl bornal acrylate. Um, let's see if I can keep going saying, saying all these um, chemicals. Hydroxypropyl methacrylate, ethylene glycol, dimethyl acrylate, and urethane acrylates. And then you've got ethyl 2 cyanoacrylate, which is in resins. Now, they're all quite acceptable in most instances, but you do need to make sure that you are reading up on these ingredients because it's quite often put out there on lots of science pages, which ones are this year's known allergens. Um, and we, we have had um, quite a lot of information through various nail groups as to um, people reacting to quite a lot of these ingredients. And as I said, you know, they are safe to use as long as they're being used safely. So that's my um, presentation. Thank you so much for joining. We'll open this group up for questions. Um, and I will actually make the presentation itself available to you. I'm going to send it to Amanda and then whoever would like a copy of it um, can certainly have it. Georgie, thank you. That's been really, really interesting. And so many people have been saying it's been helpful to kind of freshen up on these things and actually um, go over it because it is quite an intricate thing and it is sort of on the rise at the moment. So it's quite important that techs know how to deal with it. Um, lots of people already have been sending their emails because they want to get a copy of the presentation. But just if anybody else is watching on Facebook or on Zoom, if you just post in your email address, I will send the presentation to you later today so you can kind of go through it all again. Um, it really is jam packed with information. So I'd recommend that you do it. Um, but I think something I wanted to ask you actually, which I thought was quite interesting, is you said that it's on the rise, obviously, because people have been buying these kits at home in lockdown and doing their own nails. So I guess there's a chance that as techs get back to work, they're going to see a lot of this in salon where people are coming in with the issue. How do you kind of address that with the client and let them know what this is, how it's occurred, and also kind of, I guess, trying to encourage them not to do their nails at home and to see a professional? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is, is that some people might not admit to having done that. So yeah. I would address it if a client was sat in front of me and I know in my heart that they've been doing their own nails, I would be saying, you know, a lot of people have been using home use kits and unfortunately yeah. there are chemicals in there that are known allergens. It can cause certain things to happen with your nails and then unfortunately if you do become allergic to this product you're not going to be able to use it again so i would kind of talk to them as if they haven't done it but i know that there are people yeah. and it will make them think about what they're doing so mm. i you know people need to be careful or just educate themselves by going on a class you know even if they yeah. don't make money out of it and they want to do it at home on themselves it's still worth taking a professional class with a professional brand so that mm. they can learn to do it themselves. You know, a client, I wouldn't feel threatened as a tech to tell my client to take a course because most mm. of them aren't going to want to, you know, invest the money that we've invested mm. for products and professional training. So it makes them think. And, you know, as I said in my presentation, we need to educate them as to what these allergies can be then tell them what to do if that occurs so obviously if they come to you with an allergy and it is nail separation or something that's quite severe you wouldn't be able to do their nails no you have to turn them away so yeah i guess it's a difficult situation and you don't want to start to accuse your client but mm. you'd obviously say to them if you if they've admitted to doing it you'd say to them look we'll get your nails back to health we'll make sure this doesn't happen again i can offer you alternatives mm systems yeah and actually we had um one person who's watching in zoom who said that um they had one client with an allergic reaction um but they're a severe nail biter so i guess they're pretty much ingesting it so again what kind of tips can you give you you know techs do have clients that just insistently kind of bite their nails i guess that is part of the issue isn't it yeah definitely now obviously if they're if they're biting their nails and they have an allergy you know, if they've got overexposure on their nails, mm. um, it, especially if there's a fungus present, then they need to be told that, you know, it's they're, what if they're told that they have a fungus on the nails, it might put them off actually biting them in the first place. <laughs> yeah. 
if they're prone to allergies um, and yet don't have any symptoms of an allergy on their nails, mm. then I would certainly say they need to have a regular manicure or even artificial nails to prevent them doing that. Because most nail biters, once they've got an artificial nail system on, they do tend to stop biting even the skin around their nails. So mm. it has got quite good benefits if they just have something put on their nails. And um, also you mentioned obviously the importance of cleaning and um, getting rid of things correctly. But obviously at the moment due to coronavirus, everyone's having to wear PPE and a lot of extra PPE than they might normally wear. Mm -hmm. um, so if a nail tech is wearing like the goggles or a visor, do they need to be cleaning this regularly during the day or anything like that? Is there anything they need to be doing with those items? Because I know you said they need to change their gloves often. Yeah. But because they've got the shield or if they've got a nail desk shield, is there more they need to be doing? Well, the thing is, what we've all come to learn during lockdown is we've all been doing every step that's been necessary in our salons anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we need to take we know that dust should be at a minimum we know that vapors should be at a minimum um so the only additional thing is passing on literally from your mouth and i know it sounds disgusting but from <laughs> your mouth to a way that they can absorb some where if you've sneezed or if you've coughed so obviously the extra ppe equipment needs to be kept clean as well so that's mm -hmm inside and outside of your visor or a screen if you're using a screen um gloves should always be changed frequently anyway you know and masks need to be changed frequently so the rules are exactly the same if you were wearing ppe before you're doing the exact same thing mm -hmm. um, you know and a lot of people have said this is what we already do in our salons you know marion newman's been campaigning right from the beginning and helping everybody to learn everything that they should have been doing from the start from mm -hmm. before COVID, you know, so if you're really going um, along the health and safety guidelines that are out there, then you should have been safe in the first place. I think salons are the safest, safest places to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that so many people have said this year is that the salon is such a clean and hygienic environment anyway. So it's very frustrating with the government, um, definitely during the first lockdown and the reopening. Um, some other people have asked as well whether you could recommend, is there any certain gloves that you recommend or any ventilation units or systems that you think are particularly good? Um, I have seen the ventilation units that have been mentioned, I think in the nail tech awareness group, I myself haven't tried it. Um, so I would definitely do some research into um, which ones because I personally, I don't know which one to recommend. I wouldn't like to be um, affiliated with a certain brand mm. of product um, without having tested it myself. But um, there's, there's been quite a few that have been recommended um, in, I think, the Nail Tech Awareness Group, I think even in Madge's group, um, and also along the lines of the um, autoclaves as well. They've been recommended recently. I mean, it's, it's not something that was um, nail law as such to have an autoclave, but I think a lot of people feel now that it's something that they want to do as an extra over and above um, what they have currently been doing. Yeah. Um, just so you know, so many people are asking for a copy of this presentation. Um, so just anybody who's watching, if you've already put your email address in, then I will send it to you later today. But I know a couple of people have asked if they could direct message it. Absolutely. Um, DM it to the PB inbox and I will get them sent out later today. Um, but that's all we have time for, Georgie. It's been absolutely brilliant and so informative. I feel like I've learned a lot as well, <laughs> just from it. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see you at some point in the future, guys, at some event or something or another. Um, but yeah, do send me the presentation and I'll pass it on to everybody. But thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye.